we're lacking field data. Um, and, um, and so there's a, a great need there. And I think there's, a, there's still really nagging questions about how the rate of change of wind speed in tornadoes may affect loads. And so there's some really good open questions to be looking at um, and various people are looking at that. We do know some things. Um, this is, a, this is a, an image from uh, one of the papers from Partha Sarkar's group. He did some really nice PIV measurements around buildings. And, and in the image on the left, uh, the tornado is, is relatively close uh, to the building. You can see that the stagnation point is on the, on the left face, leftward face of that left image. And if you look at the streamlines, um, you can see that the curvature is really changing the leeward walls and uh, the direction of, of the stagnation point and the flow in, in the wake are, are not aligned. And so the horizontal loads are clearly changing in this kind of case. And so there's some good information now that's available about that. We've been working on that too, that Western, um, and we show those effects of, of streamlined curvature. For low buildings, often it's uplift that are, is the key thing uh, uh, for design. And it looks like uplift loads aren't changing that much, at least uh, for the main structural loads. Um, although the effective wind direction may be changing, which may change how internal pressures and the external pressures on the roof interact. And there's been some nice work by David Roosh and others uh, looking at that kind of issue. So this area is being looked at. There's still some significant open questions, and, uh, and, but progress is being made. There's also tornadoes uh, have, the, have that very strong static pressure drop. And, uh, and I think there's still really, to me in my mind, open questions about that, particularly with how tornado vortex generators uh, generate the static pressure and the peak wind speed. And again, we're lacking full-scale field data. Um, that's going to be a common theme with this um, and, and it's something we need to look at. Tornado vortex generators, of course, um, don't generate the thermodynamics and their Reynolds numbers are relatively lower and so there's still questions about uh, that. Handling that, I think we can do that and I believe Fred, Fred Hahn and his, his comments later on will be talking a little bit about some static pressure effects. Of course, when you talk about uncertainty on wind loads and the controlling parameters, wind speed, of course, is the, is the most dominant parameter. Um, uh, loads, of course, go as, as, as velocity squared. And in tornadoes, we, we, we get our wind speeds from damage observations. And so um, there's an indirect step in, in knowing what tornado wind speeds are. And again, there's, I think, some significant open questions in that regard. Um, Wind speed estimates based on engineering calculations, uh, forensic analysis give us uh, some confidence and those, have, those approaches have been validated with a lot of great work uh, on hurricanes by things like the Florida Coastal Monitoring Program where they put towers and have instrumented houses uh, measuring pressures on surfaces that give us confidence that we're able to do these kinds of estimates. Of course, we do need to know the details of tornado wind fields and the static pressures and things like that to, to do some of that assessment. But in general, we have some confidence about that. Um, this is really embodied, embodied, the wind speed estimates are embodied by the, by the enhanced Fujita scale. Of course, Fujita's original scale from the 1970s um, was modified by Texas Tech University in the mid 2000s. And they brought in this concept of damage indicators. So what are the things that are damaged in, in the storms? And of course, in, in the US and Canada, our primary indicator is wood frame houses. These are our most common structures and they, they, they span the continent. Um, one of the really nice things that Texas Tech did in the enhanced Fujita scale is this concept of the degrees of damage. And so you start from threshold of damage, uh, DOD1, if you look at the table on the right, up to complete destruction of the house at DOD10. And so you have this sequence of failures and with wind speeds with them um, to help assess the damage. These were of course developed by expert judgment and, uh, and some of them, some of these items have been validated by engineering calculations. Uh, uh, fragility curves, of course, support um, some of this analysis. If you look at, um, uh, on the left, uh, this is probably a failure versus wind speed. Um, the, gray, the gray highlighted area is DOD6, for, uh, for which is the roof coming off of the house, and, and the curves are our fragility calculations using wind tunnel data and, and full scale uh, capacities to, to estimate the fragility curve. 
And you can see that for gable roofs, this works pretty well. On the right-hand curve, for hip roofs, um, it's not as good. Um, but we can, we can account for these things, and it gives us some confidence in the EF scale. Um, I think as wind engineers, one of the areas where we've been lacking um, other hazards like earthquake engineering is we don't have fragility curves for all of these structures. And as we get more and more of those done, uh, I think that will help us with these damage assessments and getting wind speeds from the damage observations in tornadoes. The other part, and this is what I really want to focus on, on today, is um, wind speeds in the probabilistic sense. So as I mentioned, ASC 7, is gonna have uh, a probabilistic wind speed map for tornadoes. And you develop this much like you would for a, for a hurricane or a tropical cyclone uh, climate. Um, you have historical occurrences, you have um, uh, a physical model and you put in variation and you do a Monte Carlo simulation and you work on the wind speeds. With hurricanes, we tend to know when hurricanes occur, so we have a very good um, understanding of occurrence rates. We have anemometers that have measured wind speeds, at least on shore, and so we can validate those models with, with data. The approach is similar for tornadoes, but again, the wind speeds haven't been directly measured. They've been assessed based on, on uh, historical damage observations and assumed wind, wind field models. And all of this assumes that we're actually capturing all of the tornadoes that are occurring or capturing enough of them to be reliable and that we have the right intensity estimates. And so one of the challenges we have is with a damage based scale, if you have a, a monster tornado, but it hits nothing but farmland, it doesn't get rated as, as the true wind speed that will have occurred in that tornado. And so there's gonna be some bias in these analysis um, based on lack of, of data. And so that's what I want to focus on the rest of the talk. And, and I think it's one of the areas where um, uh, we can do quite a bit more in wind engineering. And I'd like to see um, uh, more efforts around the world to, to capture some of these things so that we can start to understand how tornadoes are occurring and perhaps changing globally. So sparsely populated areas um, lead to underreporting of tornadoes and probably under estimate, underestimates of their intensities. Tornadoes, um, at least in North America, are primarily occurring uh, in, on the Great Plains, what we call Tornado Alley, and these are farming regions. So by definition, they are not highly populated like suburban areas. They have areas with, uh, with significant populations, and when these get hit, it can be devastating. Um, but a lot of the areas um, um, have relatively few people. And so this is gonna affect uh, the probabilistic estimates. And if we come back to the idea of rising losses, a changing climate, changing population densities, um, this is going to make uh, design in the long term more challenging and the need for data more acute. So I'm going to focus on Canada. Um, this is a map of tornado occurrence in Canada. Canada has about 60 tornadoes per year. Um, and the observations, if, you, if you've been to Canada, um, University of Western Ontario is down here in the southeast. Uh, We've had uh, some strong tornadoes in, in our region uh, down here. But most of Canadian, Canada's population is, uh, is, is hovering near the US border. And so this map of tornado occurrence actually looks a lot la like our map of population density. And so we believe that there's probably quite a few tornadoes missing in these sparsely populated areas. And in fact, it's a little bit, um, um, I think true that um, tornadoes are also occurring where there is population that are just being missed because they're going over farmlands and things like that. Uh, again, where, where there is uh, a few damage indicators. To account for that, um, colleagues at University of Toronto and Environment Canada um, tried to take this into account. So they took the data on the, from the previous slide, those actual observations. They added in lightning data as a proxy for thunderstorms, as a proxy for tornadoes, and then weighted it with population density. And then they revised the map of, of tornado occurrence in Canada. And they estimate, so this is a modeled number, but they estimate about 150 tornadoes per year. And so the question is, is this analysis right? Is it verifiable? And can we do anything um, uh, to validate that? I think this problem also uh, exists uh, in the US and probably around the world. Um, when you put um, uh, tornadoes across all of North America, for example, there's, there's some clear gaps. 
uh, in, in the Great Plains and again in areas of the US where there's low populations uh, here in, in northern Michigan um, and uh, around Lake Superior, um, there seems to be a lack of, of tornadoes. And in the eastern regions um, uh, of southern Quebec and New Brunswick and the northeast of the US, there looks like there's also a gap uh, in, in tornado occurrence. And so this probably is a common problem, not just in Canada, but in, in many parts of the world. I can imagine in, in Europe, uh, in, in, in China and places like that, there's also going to be um, these, these places where there's lack of occurrence data. So we formed uh, the, something called the Northern Tornadoes Project. Um, uh, I don't know if I was inspired by the Toronto Raptors and their, their hashtag, We the North. Um, but, uh, you know, Canada is a northern climate, so you don't tend to think of it as, as a, a tornado prone area, but we do have our, our share of them, so we called it the Northern Tornadoes Project. And the idea of this project was to, to, get, the, to get the true tornado occurrence for Canada to validate the statistical uh, modeling. We also wanted to explore methods for improved detection of tornado damage paths in, in forests, croplands, and, uh, and prairies. And we wanted to improve also um, the, the method for intensity estimates in these sparsely populated areas. Um, we have pretty good estimates now for things like suburban neighborhoods where we can do the fragility calculations on the buildings, but for trees and crops and things, um, this is an area that I think uh, is quite important. And it's gonna be important if we're gonna have a a an understanding of the global tornado climatology as well, because in Japan and in China and Europe, you build buildings differently than we do in North America. And if we use an EF scale that's based on North American construction, it, it's not too helpful. We all have trees, we all have vehicles, there's debris in every storm. I think there's ways we can, we can, we can explore that. So we can't do this alone. This is the, the project team. Um, I'm really grateful to Dave Sills who, who joined us after 20 plus years at Environment Canada to lead this project. And we have a team of meteorologists, engineers, GIS specialists, communications people, um, and we have colleagues at other universities. Um, Jen Spinney is at York University and she's looking at the social impact. So when we try to capture the data for tornadoes, we're also trying to understand the impacts on people and Jen is leading that work. Um, of course, you can't do this without money either and uh, Impact WX is the, is, the, is the social impact fund that is funding this work and, and their mandate is really, they're looking to uh, improve people's response and safety during severe weather. So there's alignment with, with this foundation and with what we're trying to do in terms of resilient construction um, and designed for tornadoes and capturing the data to do so. So I'm going to go through this really quickly just over our, our, our methodology. Uh, we use the Canadian radar network and we use social media as really the first pass to get at, at the, at the uh, tornado occurrence. Uh, Twitter has been amazing for us. We have used our own hashtags um, and we have uh, partners that also tweet us when they see, when they see damage on, on social media like Twitter, Facebook and, and others. And uh, so we can capture data from that. Then the primary data sources that we, we gather are, um, is really satellite information. Um, the imaging of the earth now um, routinely every day is a boon to um, uh, tornado identification. In the upper right, you can see a, see a tornado path um, uh, from the scars of, of trees uh, in the boreal forest uh, from the satellite imagery. And so we are able to, to identify that. The resolution of that is about three meters per pixel. And with that, you can see um, tornado scars pretty clearly. It's challenging. It's really good for EF2. It's challenging for EF1 and, and really hard for, uh, for EF0 tornadoes, but it's a really useful tool for, for this kind of a project where we're trying to capture information in sparsely populated areas. We still do ground surveys. We're trying to capture data of every kind and all the data that we can for the project. So we do ground surveys to try to capture structural details for building performance in particular. Um, we use aerial photography for regions that are inaccessible by vehicle, and that gives us really good resolution. You can see down to the branches level um, with that kind of photography. And uh, we're more and more using drones, which gives outstanding resolution, and I think is the way we're going to be going forward for all the surveys that we can. 
Um, certainly this year with the pandemic where we were um, um, not permitted to go very far from, from campus, um, drone, drone technology is something that uh, is going to be really useful um, when you can't have interactions in society. Um, anyway, so those are the tools that we use. Um, and with that, we, we work with uh, Environment Canada on, on identifying what kind of event was it, a tornado, downburst, or something else, and coming up with ratings using the Canadian EF scale. And so we would collaborate with, uh, with our, our National Weather Service at Environment Canada on, on doing that aspect. We also have partners with, partnership with the Weather Network, which is, uh, which is analogous to the Weather Channel in the US. And, um, and so they often get called when, or emailed or, or people uh, reach out to them on social media when, when they see damage. And uh, we, we work with them and they, they transmit their data to us. And in exchange, they're, they're seeing our ratings fairly early for their, for their media work. So that kind of partnership works. So Canada is a big country. It's challenging um, uh, to identify every tornado with a, with a relatively small university group, but, but I think we've been reasonably successful at that. We started just in 2017 with developing the methodology and we focused on the area north of Lake Superior. Lake Superior is right in the middle of this image here. Um, and we were in looking at, in the sparsely populated area out here where there's just really moose, uh, there's some fishing camps, there's indigenous communities, uh, but not too many people. And uh, so we focused on identifying tornadoes in that area and developed the method. And then uh, we, we went to all of Canada in 2019. And uh, we've, we've assessed that uh, we increased the tornado count by about 80% in 2019 using these methods compared to, to the previous methods. So there is some indication that the true number of tornadoes is much larger than had been previously verified. Um, you can find details of that. We just published a paper in, in BAMS and you can see details uh, pertaining to that. But it seems like one can use these methods and again, satellite imagery is really a powerful tool for, for that. So that's occurrence rates. One of the things then that we need to uh, uh, get better at is intensity um, assessments. And for this, by definition, sparsely populated areas means there's not buildings there, which means we have to use other things for intensities. And so trees, crops, grasslands, vehicles, farm buildings are the kind of structures that we want to be focusing on to get better intensity and estimates. And, and so that's what we want to talk about. So I'm going to talk about trees for a little bit. Um, and there's, I guess we have in the EF scale, there, there's differences. I just have the Canadian and US EF scales for trees uh, up here. We have the degree of damage approach, but you can see the Canadian approach and the US approach are, are really quite fundamentally different. There's a committee right now, um, a standards committee developing a new EF scale. And I think some of these differences are going to be mitigated by that. But there's also tree uh, damage indicators in the Japanese EF scale and the Europeans also have trees in their assessments. And so um, all of these are somewhat different. I think those differences can be resolved, but one of the limitations that I wanna focus on in the Canadian EF scale, for example, DOD6 is that more than 80% of the trees are, are, are snapped or uprooted or debarked uh, um, or denuded by, by missiles. And, and the expected value is in the EF2 range of wind speeds. For certain forests, we can go up to, up to EF3 for the upper bound. Um, that is kind of limiting if our primary damage indicator is, is trees in, in, in sparsely populated areas. Um, it means we, we may not be able to identify EF3, EF4, EF5 tornadoes um, based on this scale. And that's where the research comes in. Um, so this is a photograph from one of our images and you can see that trees uh, offer um, a really clear indicator of damage. One of the beautiful things about um, trees and crops um, is that they're fairly continuous for large periods. So you can see changes of intensity and understand how tornado paths um, strengthen and weaken along their path. And, and so it's a good tool for that, as long as we can get the maximum intensity. And so there's been some great research in the US on that. I have an image here from Chris Carson's paper uh, analyzing the Joplin tornado. Of course, this is a, this is a, a suburban area. 
a, a built up area with lots of houses and other structures which can be assessed and they did a very detailed analysis of the trees. And this kind of data then gives us a way of, of finding methods from the trees that can get better intensity estimates. Um, one of the examples uh, that I want to put here is for the Alonza tornado uh, in Manitoba. I grew up in Manitoba, so this area is fairly close to where I grew up. Um, and it, this was an EF4 tornado in 2018. It was the highest rated tornado in North America uh, in 2018. It was a relatively quiet year. Um, and so that was actually happened in Canada. Um, I, I don't know if that's something to be proud of or not, but I guess we talk about it all the time. So maybe we are proud of that. That EF4 rating was based on uh, structural damage uh, to a house. There was, there was a fatality uh, in this event, which was, which was tragic. You can see the path, the damage path uh, from, from the satellite imagery. It's very clearly showing up. And what I wanna talk about is some of the work Frank Lombardo's doing. So he has access to our data and he used his tree fall method for this. So he provided this slide to me. Thanks, Frank. Um, and they're estimating using um, a vortex model that they fit with, uh, with tree characteristics and, uh, and vortex characteristics, and they merge those things to assess the intensity. And so in the early stages of this tornado of the path, he found EF3 kind of wind speeds fit the damage patterns very well, and he got to EF4 on that. Um, so this is beyond the EF scale, um, but I think this is the kind of future that we can do to improve methods to get better damage estimates for, for the tornadoes. And certainly acquiring data like this will allow researchers uh, like Frank and others to, to do these kind of assessments so we can get better intensity uh, assessments. One of the things in, 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 in Canada and in the prairies is that there's a lot of grassland. And so Frank was looking at the trees, but there's also grassed areas. If we zoom in uh, on, on the right of this image, you can see some of the tree falls, but there's just grassland uh, in this area here. And when we looked on the ground, um, we just found dead grass. I mean, in the left image, you can see very clearly the track uh, through there, but on the ground, it's difficult to see. And so this is a kind of challenging damage indicator, but it's one of the things that we want to look at a little more closely. We wonder if grassland damage only occurs in high intensity tornadoes. That might be a really useful tool for us, but we need to validate that and, and capture it. And so we're trying to capture all the data we can for these kind of events and correlate it with other damage indicators like the trees, like, uh, like farm vehicles, like uh, farm buildings, and see if we can assess that. Uh, but it's something I think that, that is very useful. And it's something that satellite imagery seems like a better approach even than ground surveys to get, to get estimates. The last thing I, I wanna talk about is windborne debris. Um, debris is really a characteristic of, of tornadoes. Um, it's the thing that to me, when you do surveys afterwards really stands out. This was, a, this was the image on the screen as an EF3 tornado about hundred kilometers from, from Western. Um, and, and, uh, and just the debris, there was bricks everywhere, uh, two by four missiles everywhere, um, and, and the damage was shocking. Researchers, uh, meteorologists who are using radar information, um, they can see tornadoes occurring by the debris field as well. And so there's some interesting possibilities. And as a community, I don't think we've explored this in enough detail. I want to give one example here um, uh, just to, to, to illustrate some of the challenges, but I think also the potential. Uh, this was the Scarth, Manitoba, again, my home province. Uh, this very photogenic uh, tornado, um, but tragically there was two fatalities uh, uh, in it. Um, and it, it, it highlights the way we can, we can capture data and, and, uh, and estimate wind speeds using um, uh, debris flight. In this case, it was vehicles. There was two, uh, two vehicles that took shelter from the tornado on a driveway, and tragically, they were, they were both thrown in, in one vehicle. Um, the people survived, and, and uh, there was witness interviews, and they talked about their experience. I don't want to focus on that, but from those vehicles, we could estimate the path distances. Uh, this vehicle tra traveled between 200 and 340 meters, we estimate. And, uh, and uh, there were storm chasers in the area um, who captured video. And you can see uh, in the video, um, 
uh, very indication of large debris elements flying through the air. And so when you can find those debris elements, get the detail, in this case vehicles, assess roughly how far they flew, we can use that to back out wind speeds. But this, this kind of analysis I think is still in its early stages, but using the debris flight equations, I think there's some possibility uh, together with tornado wind fields to estimate debris. In this case for vehicles, uh, Fred Hahn has done some really nice work in the Iowa State simulator on, on flying vehicles. And so he, he actually has estimates for that. So vehicles that would fly a fairly long distance, he has found uh, from this simulator, um, high EF3, low EF4 for this kind of event. Um, so this can be embodied in the EF scale by, by observations. I think there's a lot of challenges with vehicles. A lot of vehicles are parked near houses and other buildings. Vehicles are small and, uh, and the houses are relatively large beside them. And anyone who's done wind tunnel work or written a wind tunnel report, we always write the caveat, if there's major structures nearby, it will change the wind loads. Well, for a vehicle, a major structure nearby is the house. And so there's gonna be a lot of variability with these but in fairly open areas like farming communities, uh, vehicles I think could be a very good uh, damage indicator. As I mentioned earlier, the ASCE and AMS is developing a, a, a revised EF scale and, uh, and they're also putting in proper methods for forensic analysis and use of radar, which I think is a really good development. And I think with that, um, uh, we, can, we can start to get some of these damage indicators um, in a way that's appropriate, not just for the US, but also around the world. The IAWE, the International Association of Wind Engineers, has a working group looking at international EF scales. And as part of that committee, we, uh, we tried to identify tornado currents around the world. Um, obviously the US has by far the most, but I think we're undercounting in a lot of areas. And so getting better data again would be very useful. And to do that, um, I think we need to find common damage indicators. Every country is gonna have their own EF scale or a uh, similar method when they, when they develop these. Um, and that's appropriate because you're gonna have uh, building performance, building types, uh, neighborhood patterns, and things that are, that are distinct to, to each country. But there are damage indicators that are common across all of these regions. And these tend to be these sparsely populated area damage indicators like trees, uh, uh, other natural uh, elements, like grasslands, crops, um, and vehicles. Every country has vehicles, of course, and so these are things that we can use. And debris flight, again, is a very common factor in tornadoes, and it'll be interesting um, to develop those areas. And if we do that, we could, we could um, I believe, have an international EF scale that would allow us to assess the global climatology, understand how uh, tornadoes and, uh, and over the long run, how tornadoes and other severe storms are changing with the climate and get to better uh, design processes. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop and I'll be happy uh, to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Greg. Um, if you could unshare screen, please, if that's possible. Yep. 